The next speaker is Nadja Dutschmann from Heidelberg. He's a group leader in the Heidelberg Institute for Stem Cell Technology and Experimental Medicine. And he will tell us about uh, BRCAMS and at all. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction and also for the invitation. Uh, thank you also to Ruben, who actually suggested me for the invitation. Um, so uh, basically, it's really a great honor to uh, speak here in Cambridge to such a, um, um, a competent audience. And um, yeah, so basically, uh, I'm very thankful to the previous speaker because he introduced lots of the concepts which uh, this talk is about. And um, you will tell me in between, I'll ask you whether uh, this is too much of redundancy and then we can jump over parts of it. Uh, so I have to, yeah, okay. So basically, uh, which one is what? Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, so, uh, yes, I will uh, go through a very brief introduction, and this is possible actually because the previous speaker uh, introduced the concept. So I'm going to talk about homologous recombination repair. It's an error-free DNA repair pathway, um, and um, there is the term of brackiness where we should be cautious when we use it because different people mean different things when they use the term. So the way I want to use it is that it includes every uh, sort of phenotype or endophenotype um, like uh, those caused by mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes including the mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. So it's the, inclus the inclusive version of the term brca -ness. And um, uh, basically, uh, the brca uh, arises if you have defects in homologous recombination repair, and that's probably what the term was all introduced for. Um, so uh, basically, it was uh, first observed in patients with mutations in these genes. Uh, the abbreviation comes from mutated in breast cancer, and the one was historically the first to be found, two was found afterwards. And um, uh, it was already introduced that uh, Brachanus tumors have a synthetic lethality for, to uh, a group of drugs, which is called the PARP inhibitors. Uh, and um, I will lead my talk in a way that in the end we come to the top art trial, which is a randomized controlled basket trial for the use of Olaparib, which is one of these PARP inhibitors, uh, together with trabectidin, which is a double strand break inducing agent in patients with brachiness uh, in their tumors. Uh, so now comes uh, the part where um, I would like to ask you, is the concept of mutational signatures and especially the mathematical part behind it sufficiently familiar to all of you or shall we go through the details? Uh, is there anyone who wants to go through the details? Okay. <laughs> so uh, basically, um, here I have depicted um, a DNA sequence uh, with nucleotide and uh, in oncology or in many settings in oncology, we want to have tumor and normal, match normal control sequence in order to find the somatic mutations. Those would be the ones which are different between uh, the tumor sample and the control sample. And here is a reading frame, right, for the um, tra translation of uh, the base code to the amino acid code. And I have highlighted here in red uh, some uh, locations where we have a, a single nucleotide exchange. For example, here from C to T, and this is actually a non-synonymous mutation, which in this reading frame would lead to an amino acid exchange, whereas we also would have uh, synonymous ones, like this one here, where you do have a nucleotide exchange, but it doesn't lead to an amino acid exchange. And uh, in this concept of mutational signatures, we want to consider all of them. We want to include the synonymous ones because we are interested in the imprint of mutational processes on the entirety of the genome. And uh, so basically the concept of mutational signatures, which was introduced before, uh, but here is an aspect which I would like to highlight because it was not mentioned so precisely, is that we take into account not only the nucleotide exchange itself, but we do take into account the motive context of the nucleotide exchange. So uh, the simplest motive is a, a dinucleotide here. It's the second simplest. It's a triplet context. So in the middle, we have the nucleotide exchange, and we also look at the preceding and the following base pair. And so basically, uh, we will um, call these different things features. And here, 
uh, for example, okay, it's a little bit shifted, I'm sorry, but here we have a C to T exchange in an ACT context, right? So, and here we would have a C to A exchange in a GCC context, and here similarly we would have a G to A in an AGT context. And so uh, the same nucleotide exchange could be different features depending on the motif context it lies in. And then we would build a vector for every sample. Uh, so we would have uh, to label the nucleotide exchange and the motif context. And now comes some combinatorics. So we have a letter of four, an alphabet of four letters for the basis. Every one can mutate into the other three, which, we, which would make up four times three, which is 12, right? And we have four possibilities for the preceding nucleotide, four possibilities for the following nucleotide, which is 12 times four times four is 192. But then as we see here, uh, there is, um, oh no, we don't see it, but as a DNA is reverse complemented, um, there is a one-to-one -one matching uh, between one half of these features and the other half, so we can reduce the complexity to 96. So there are going to be 96 different features if we combine the nucleotide exchange itself and the motif context. And for every single sample, we can just count how often do these occur. Uh, the mutations in the specific motive context. And why do we do that? So you have seen plots like this before. Uh, it's because it is not homogeneous across the different motive contexts or across the different features. So if there is a mutagenic agent or a mutational process, it does matter actually. Uh, it has a preference for the different features. And here is uh, signature four uh, in very bad resolution, um, which comes from uh, the action of benzapyrin, which is the main carcinogen from tobacco smoke. And you see that it has a heavy um, preference for C2A nucleotide exchanges, but even within the C2A, the 16 different possibilities for triplet motive context are not homogeneous, okay? Uh, so now, if we have a cohort with more than one sample, we can concatenate all these uh, row vectors into a matrix. And um, what uh, then uh, people like Ludmila Alexandrov and Peter Stratton have done is that they have run pattern recognition on this matrix. Um, and basically, they have used a technology which is called non-negative matrix factorization, which is a de novo discovery technique. And they found initially 22 and then 30 and now it's at, um, it, it was recently at 43 and now it's at 67 because the um, cohort on which these signatures are being trained on is ever increasing. But there probably is going to be a plateau uh, because um, the, the power may be sufficient to uh, discover the big majority of the underlying signatures. And is, it, as, is it known how that scales with the size of your cohort? I don't think so. It's more an observation um, with the numbers, how they actually evolve. So it's... Did you, is there a sense of how that's scaling with their cohort? I wouldn't say so. Because basically, this number is, in the, on the mathematical side, it's called the factorization rank. And there are different strategies for choosing the optimal factorization rank. And here in the game, there are different players using different implementations of NMF, and they also have different criteria for choosing the optimal factorization rank. So if there was a consensus, maybe we could make such an argument, but for now, I guess, rather not. That would be a useful thing to do, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because at some point, if, it, if, it's, not, if, it's, if it's monotonic and it doesn't plateau, then what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's... So there was an argument once uh, where they're trying to compare it to um, species discovery in the jungle. So if I go into the jungle for one day, how many species do I discover? How many species do I discover? Three times, four times, and five times out of the ten I've discovered. And then you can extrapolate to how many yeah. species you haven't found. Yeah, yeah. And some people try to do the signatures, but it doesn't really hold up. Oh, yeah. so, um, some people are us. Some people are us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they're you. <laughs> some of them. <laughs> more in the community that people try to share, uh, assume it, but assess it, it never really works. So it might be more time than time. Sorry. Sorry. No problem. Um, okay, so and as it was told before, um, like half of the signatures have an asserted mutational process which is underneath it, but the other half doesn't, right? So that's even more of a problem, I would say. Uh, that we have these patterns, but for half of them, we cannot really tell what they are. Still, uh, those where we know what they stand for are really important. 
and uh, notably there's this signature three where if you look at the comparison, uh, it's actually a, a signature with, with a very weak signal, right? It has no strong predominance like other signatures have. But so it's a bad signature, uh, but still it's very important because this is the one uh, which is linked to uh, defects in homologous recombination repair. And uh, among this half of the signatures where you can um, attribute mutational processes, you can group the mutational processes. So some are linked to aging, uh, like a molecular clock. Uh, and um, uh, what the, the most important one with the molecular clock feature is signature one, which is spontaneous deamination. So uh, methylated cytosines are uh, the chemically least stable part in DNA. And that's actually why C2T is the most frequent mutation in general. And um, here you see that there is a strong predominance in C2T nucleotide exchanges. So this is what happens anyway by uh, thermodynamics, basically. Yeah? Uh, the other uh, clock-like signature would be signature 5. There are also signatures which are linked to carcinogens, like signature 4, which we have seen before. Uh, there are uh, signatures which are linked to DNA repair defects, like the Bruckerness one and the mismatch repair defect signatures, like uh, the previous speaker has mentioned. Uh, there are um, also signatures uh, which I would say are linked to mutagenic enzymatic systems. So these are systems which on purpose introduce mutations into the genome, like uh, the APOBEC enzymes. The function of the APOBEC enzymes being that if you have viral insertion of DNA into the host genome, you want to somehow destroy that, and therefore you do have mutagenic enzymes which physiologically introduce mutations. And in some cancers, uh, these mutagenic enzymatic systems are reactivated and get dysregulated um, on a broader scale. Uh, okay, so this is mutational signatures. And here, uh, a little bit uh, more of mathematics. So um, I already mentioned the NMF, the non-negative matrix factorization, and it's really similar to principal component analysis. Uh, so you have a big matrix, which you want to decompose into two smaller matrices. So the big one is, is V, and this in our nomenclature is going to be called the mutational catalog, which has 96 rows and as many columns as there are samples, okay? And we want to decompose it into W and H. Uh, and W is going to be called the mutational signatures, so the basis patterns, the 30 um, patterns which we have seen uh, in, the, in the plot before. And um, H is going to be called the exposures. So that's going to tell us which patient has how much of which signature. Uh, so basically, the contributions of the different basis signals. And, um, if we just have V and we know neither of these, we have to do a de novo analysis, which is the harder task. If we already know the signatures, we just want to find the contributions, this would be a supervised analysis and would be the easier task, okay, mathematically speaking. And um, uh, that's why I say um, V is known for NMF and W and H are both unknown, whereas in the supervised setting, um, one of the two can be known and most of the time it's the signatures which are known. So now, why did I mention principal component analysis and NMF? Uh, the thing is that they both do a very similar thing, but they have different constraints, okay? So PCA has an orthogonality constraint, and that automatically means that in a Euclidean space, you must introduce negative numbers, right? Because otherwise you cannot reach orthogonality. Whereas in NMF, it's the other way around. You do not want to have any negative numbers, therefore you cannot be orthogonal, okay? Um, the only way to reach both is actually uh, a, a Cartesian basis, but um, we want to do dimensionality reduction, so we cannot do a Cartesian basis. Uh, okay, and um, uh, I wrote a software package for the supervised analysis, so for the right-hand side, uh, and it, I said it's easier, but it's not trivial, uh, because of course you do have a constraint of non-negativity as well, so you have to do non-negatively squares, for example, and this, the thing about YAPSA, there are many different tools which do that by now, uh, the unique selling point of YAPSA is that it uses it uses signature-specific cutoffs. So basically, it uh, says that depending on the pattern of the signature, it must reach a certain number in order to be called in a sample. Uh, so for example, uh, the Bracken signature, which has a very, very diffuse pattern, would have to go over a higher cutoff than a signature with, with a very precise pattern, okay? Uh, so that gives you some increase in precision, and it actually increases sensitivity and specificity simultaneously. 
Uh, okay, uh, now uh, next step uh, to uh, get closer to Brackenness. Uh, so um, I call this a compound genomic measure. And here are two cases from our molecular tumor board uh, in Heidelberg. And this is a molecular tumor board which um, offers uh, diagnostics to patients who have gone through all lines of treatment before. So basically these are patients who are going to die and um, they uh, basically uh, get this offer if they fulfill certain entrance criteria. And um, here, for example, is a patient who has no brackenness, okay? So uh, there is no signature three. This is the result of the signature analysis and it is uh, usually going to be displayed like this in a stacked bar plot. And the different colors uh, represent the different signatures. And um, here's the copy number plot of the same uh, patient. So, um, the different colors are the different chromosomes, and if it's rather flat, uh, there are no bigger uh, copy number aberrations. And um, so this is a non brackenness case, and interestingly, this is a triple negative breast cancer with a familiar history of breast cancer and even a germline one BRCA mutation. So why did I choose this patient? This is to show you that there is a grain of salt in the soup, right? A brackenness patient or a, a germline BRCA mutation carrier can indeed have a non brachanus tumor, right? Uh, because uh, they do have an increased risk of getting a brachanus tumor, but at the same risk as everybody else, they can also get a non brachanus tumor, right? And uh, therefore, if, uh, yes? Sorry, let me ask you, I mean, there are people around that, that are questioning the reliability of the BRCA signature among all the signals, saying that the others are really very strong, like the upper back, but the BRCA one needs some work on it because you think not very good at really differentiating So I will come to aspects of this question later. So I think um, there is a lack of reliability in the mutation calling because the BRCA genes are actually not very well mapped as compared to other genes and uh, you may miss mutations on the BRCA genes. But here's the opposite case, right? Here we do have the mutation, but... Yeah. And that's what I want to come to later, basically because here we do not have only the mutational signature, we also have the genomic instability criterion and we actually quantify that and we make a composite biomarker with the scoring system. And um, I would never rely on mutational signatures alone, but I think that there is a value in combining the different layers of information the confidence is not absolute, of course, right? But it increases confidence. No? Uh, so I, uh, basically, yeah, okay, this is a problem with the um, numbering. Here is another case, which is a BRCA negative, or BRCA ness negative. Uh, we do not have uh, the signature three, uh, the BRCA ness signatures. We do have a flat genome, no uh, bigger copy number events, and um, basically here everything fits together, right? This is a true negative case, no mutations in BRCA whatsoever. Um, yeah? What's your y-axis on the plots? On the here? Uh, yeah, actually on both plots. Okay, so here it's the number of single nucleotide variant explained by the respective signatures, because that's what comes out of uh, your analysis. You can do that relative or absolute, and this is the absolute, right? So this patient has 600 and something SNVs, and um, like 150 out of them can be explained by the green signature, which is spontaneous demination. Isn't that a bit low? 60 SNVs for uh, hemorrhagic cancer who have been through multiple rounds of treatment? Yes, yeah, so basically, um, I come to this point as well. In our tumor board, we have a mixture of whole genome sequenced and whole exome sequenced cases. And because we also want to take into account the synonymous ones and also the non-coding ones, uh, you can have completely different scales of numbers based on the different technologies used. And this is a, a special challenge. So. Uh, that's also part of uh, the due course. But um, uh, this is a special challenge if you want to do biomarker development and you want to account for different technologies. So we have a highly heterogeneous cohort, uh, which is reflected also by these numbers. Yeah. And here, uh, basically, it's uh, the log two uh, copy number. Uh, so log two ratio of um, tumor copy number versus match normal control copy number. So 
Definitely, yes. So that de depends on your variant calling pipeline, right? So how well does it uh, cope with a subclonal variant? You know? I, I would argue that our pipeline does do that not so bad, <laughs> but of course not perfectly. <laughs> uh, okay, and here are two positive cases, right? So uh, you have um, the golden signature, which is the signature three, the Bracken signature. And um, there is a lot of uh, changes going on in the copy number plot. Um, so this definitely is genomic instability. And it is a renal cell carcinoma uh, in a germline BRCA2 frame shift deletion carrier. So here everything fits together, right? Uh, here's another case uh, with a contribution from uh, signature three. Um, and um, it also has a high genomic instability as objectivated here in the copy number plot. A uh, breast cancer um, patient with a germline BRCA1 stop gain mutation. Um, and even uh, if we have transcriptomic data, we can even tell that the healthy allele has been completely lost in the tumor. Uh, okay, so this is basically what motivated us uh, to um, try to integrate these different layers of inf information and um, aim at building a biomarker. And um, uh, to uh, build this biomarker, um, it was already mentioned that we have to uh, quantify the genomic instability, and there are different measures for that. And one is the HRD score, or sometimes also referred to LOH HRD score because the abbreviation HRD in itself is redundantly used for different things. Uh, so this is uh, according to Apkevich et al. And uh, basically uh, what they do, uh, or what they have introduced already in 2002, is that basically they looked at segments of LOH, of, uh, of loss of heterozygosity, which inclu includes deletions, and um, uh, they looked at the size distribution, right? And uh, found out that using some filtering steps and some uh, cutoffs, you can discriminate between um, brackenness cases and non brackenness cases. So uh, here in red, you would have the non brackenness cases, and in blue, you would have the brackenness cases. And uh, it seems like you could draw a line somewhere in these, and then you could try to separate, right? And um, basically, the way they found this to be most precise is that you do a smoothing over mm -hmm. your different segments, which come out of uh, somatic copy number aberration calling. And the window size of the smoothing is three megabase pairs. And then as a criterion in the end, you take segments which are bigger than 15 megabase pairs, so really big segments, and you count them. And this is going to be your HRD score. Okay, so a smoothing step and then counting the big segments and uh, you get the HRD, and then that's uh, basically the number which is displayed here, and you can argue uh, to find a good cutoff for that, uh, and probably depending on technology and uh, on the entity you study, this cutoff may be different from uh, situation to situation. And uh, then they retrospectively analyzed some clinical data with survival, and uh, basically, um, you see that under certain conditions, uh, so if you treat ovarian cancer patients with PARP inhibitor, you see that those with a high HRD score uh, profit more than those which are with a low HRD score. Uh, okay, and the second um, quantitative measure of genomic instability, which I want to introduce, is the LST. That's the number of large-scale state transitions. It's also a paper from 2002 by Popova et al., and basically what they have done is very similar to the HRD criterion, but here we do not count segments, we count breakpoints, okay? And we also do a smoothing step with three megabase pairs as a window side, and then we count those breakpoints where on either side of the breakpoint, uh, the segment is at least 10 megabase pairs big. So in both settings, we count the big segments, uh, but in one case, we count the segments themselves, and in the other, we count those breakpoints which have big segments on either side. Uh, and here's the rationale why and uh, how they came to these numbers. And for us, it's something we can use, right? This is from literature, and it's, it's uh, at least to some degree established. And um, we come to a, a point where basically we start to define our biomarker, and uh, we have four criteria, uh, two so-called phenotypic or endophenotypic criteria. So this is basically the imprint of the repair defect on the genome. So one is uh, the mutational signature, and then the second one is the genomic instability, as I just explained. 
And then we have two genotypic criteria, one being somatic mutations in genes involved in this pathway, in this repair, and the other one being germline mutations in uh, this pathway. And why do we actually bother to make two different criteria? That is because in somatic mutations, we can be rather inclusive. We can rely on lower confidence, uh, like functional impact scores, whereas in germline, we want to be really precise, right? We want to actually take only uh, the ACMG, American College of Medical Genetics, class four and five variants, because we want them, we want to know that those are uh, damaging and uh, pathologic mutations. Now, how do we bring all this together? Uh, uh, so first, I am going to motivate this. Where did this lead us? I go, um, uh, I'll present the details of the biomarker later. Um, this has led us to a clinical trial, which is called the TOPART trial. So it's a randomized phase two study of trabectidin and olaparib compared to physician's choice. That means that all other information from the molecular profiling and from the tumor board can be used for these patients. Uh, in subjects with uh, pretreated um, advanced or recurrent solid uh, tumors harboring DNA repair deficiencies. So this is our trial. And uh, basically we have this molecular tumor board being our base uh, cohort. And we recruit, we enrich the patient with this biomarker, which I have briefly already mentioned. It's a phase two clinical trial because there has been a phase one clinical trial for this combination of drugs before. And uh, there's a randomization, and basically uh, there's going to be uh, four or five cycles uh, of uh, this drug combination as compared to physician's choice. And there's a crossover possibility um, uh, with an evaluation after four months. Um, and then, of course, if it works, patient can, patients can go on with that. Um, there was this phase one clinical trial before, which actually indicates uh, good dosing for us. Um, oops. And this is embedded in um, a setting where from this molecular tumor board, uh, we have different baskets, right? And one basket is the DNA damage. About, this is what I'm going to talk about today, or what I am talking about today. But there are other baskets as well, uh, where you can then uh, basically give the patients targeted therapies. And uh, right now in uh, this um, cohort, we have sequenced like uh, 1,500 patients with whole exome sequencing and roughly seven or 800 with whole genome sequencing. And of course, there's a huge um, effort to actually get feedback with uh, follow-up data, with survival, uh, in order to actually feed these baskets with uh, clinical trial information. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the phase one trial, which has uh, been carried out before by others. And uh, this is to tell that basically uh, there is some uh, indication uh, that there's synergy between the two drugs, right? So it was phase one. This was not the primary endpoint of a phase one trial. But still, out of the phase one trial, you can see that there's quite response in part of the patients. Uh, this was done in a soft tissue sarcoma. Uh, OK, and here um, is just an argument about the crossover design. Uh, so basically, uh, you want to randomize, of course. Um, but uh, basically, uh, this argument was here yesterday as well. It's very sad if a patient where you know uh, he or, or where it's very likely that he or she would profit from the targeted therapy and uh, he or she is randomized to the control arm, um, you are somehow uh, tied to this decision and uh, there is no uh, flexibility. But if you allow a crossover, basically you evaluate after four months and uh, you could offer a second chance to this patient to go into the other arm. However, this is at the cost of um, precision in your signal in the evaluation of the clinical trial in the end. Uh, okay, so now um, I mentioned these criteria. So uh, here's a hugely inclusive gene list for uh, the genotypic criterion for somatic variants. So this is everything uh, which you could potentially think of having a relevance for uh, homologous recombination. Uh, why can we be so inclusive? Because the weight which this criterion gets in the end is really low, okay? And why do we uh, choose such a low weight? That is because uh, there was a generation of clinical trials like 10 or 15 years ago uh, for PARP inhibitors in various entities, and they focused only on the genotypic criteria, on germline mutations and later on on somatic mutations. And the signal was not strong enough uh, because basically they 
missed patients. They had a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives because mutation calling in these genes is not reliable enough. Uh, so basically, there is a scoring system with points. And for the sake of time, I will uh, not go too much in depth of that. Uh, just to say that for the germline um, uh, criterion, the list is much shorter. Yeah? Can you just give me a, a sense, uh, an intuitive sense of like, so you actually track that massive list, you've got a, what, a couple hundred genes. So for an individual patient, how many of those would contribute to an actual score? So um, it doesn't matter how many are mutated. If one is mutated, he gets a point. No, no, just... And if more are mutated, he still gets one point. Yeah? Sure. Oh. So it's just if any of them is hit, it's. Anything it's... on that list. Yeah. So you, you, you either get zero, one, or two points yeah. total. Yeah. There's not some, you can't get 100 points. No, no. No. Okay. It's loss of function on the pathway or not. Okay. Um, OK, and um, here, as I said, for uh, the germline variants, we want to be much more restrictive. Uh, and for the phenotypic criteria, uh, I told you there's the mutational signatures and the, um, uh, the genomic instability criteria. And um, we give either one or two points. And um, we, do, we initially debated, are we going to give that based on the contribution of the signature? We opted against that. We are going with a confidence interval argument. So uh, the way the signature contributions are being computed with the software package YAPSA uh, allows us to give confidence intervals to the exposures. And our argument is now that if zero is in the confidence interval, we have less confidence in this call. And this is only one. So if the signature is not present at all, it's zero points. If it's present, but the zero is in the confidence interval, we give one point. Whereas if the confidence interval excludes zero, we give two points. We really believe in this call then. Okay. How do you do the confidence interval? Yeah, it's, it's a standard NMF. Uh, no, it, I mean it, it wouldn't be NMF anyway because it's the supervised setting, so it's um, non-negatively squares. But that still wouldn't allow um, confidence intervals. So it's a con the concept of profile likelihoods, with, uh, which comes from ODE modeling. Oh no, not ODE, uh, but. Um, yeah, yes, it's ODE modeling, actually. And the concept in ODE modeling is if you have a very high dimensional space um, and uh, you want to get a measure of confidence, you fix one of your parameters and you redo the modeling with the rest of the parameters. Uh, and then uh, you basically see how well you approach the um, initial solution involving everything. And that uh, basically, uh, basically gives you, you have to go do a Gauss-Newton afterwards, and you can approximate your confidence by this way. So that's the concept which we then translated to mutational signatures. And um, the equivalence is that here, uh, the different dimensions in ODE modeling correspond to the different signatures in our setting here. Uh, OK. And uh, then for um, the uh, genomic instability measure, uh, we have a scoring system. Uh, I explained to you uh, the HRD and LST parameters. And if it's bigger than 10, we give one point. And if it's bigger than 20, we give two points. This is a little bit arbitrary. Uh, however, um, there's one argument which um, I want to make. So I recycled this slide from a very technical <laughs> discussion. Um, there is a third criterion, which is always mentioned together with HRD and LST, which is TAI, telomeric allelic imbalances. And we don't use this because we do have holy exome cases, right? So it wouldn't make sense to do any quantification of telomeric allelic imbalances in exomes, right? So uh, because of our setting where we have this mixture of technologies, we focus only on these. And I would say it's actually surprising that CNV calling or copy number aberration calling works as well in exomes, right? Uh, but uh, the off-target reads are sufficient to uh, find breakpoints and to do copy number calling. Um, OK, and then we have this sum score. And uh, basically, uh, the cutoff is 3. Uh, and we make a distinction whether phenotypic criteria are involved or it's just genotypic criteria involved. And uh, so 3P would, be, uh, would mean that uh, phenotypic criteria have contributed. 3G meaning it's only from genotypic criteria. And the cutoff is exactly between these two. So if you have 3P, 4, 5, or 6, or 7, then uh, we would call these patients biomarker positive, And they can be recruited for the top-up trial. 
Uh, okay, and then this is how it looks like in our molecular tumor board. So there's a script which aggregates all these information uh, and then um, asserts the point. The only one where this cannot be done automatically is the germline stuff uh, because human geneticists um, want to do that on their own and by hand and very important. Of course, it could be automated, but uh, it's not allowed for now. Um, and uh, so in the tumor board, um, this is presented and then we could uh, say, okay, a score is uh, this and that and a uh, patient can be included or not. Um, okay, and uh, uh, here is some preliminary data. So the, uh, we did the choice of parameter. I would not even call it training, but the choice of parameter has been done on a retrospective analysis. Uh, of our cohort, and um, it was um, 336 patients at that point in time. And this is, um, I'm sorry for the German annotation of the entities, uh, but this is how it's been distributed. And I'm showing this because uh, basically we have not uh, a composition of our basket which corresponds to the prevalence of these entities in the population, right? We are highly biased to either stuff which cannot be treated in smaller hospitals or uh, to stuff where our specialists are um, actually known for. So this is the case for soft tissue sarcomas, for example, right? This does not correspond to the prevalence of soft tissue sarcomas in the population, but uh, we have specialists for that in our center and therefore this is highly enriched. It's roughly um, equal between the genders and this is the age distribution. Um, that matters to us because in, on the long term we may do a pediatric stratum and um, the pediatric stratum will actually be an IA, adolescent and young adults. And it's likely that part of the adult population is better uh, matching with the IA stratum than the old adults, right? Because uh, what happens is then that in the older adults we have carcinomas, whereas in younger adults and in IAs we do not have carcinomas. And this makes a huge difference actually in the whole um, in the whole aspect here. And um, 10 minutes? Oh, okay, uh, I'm almost done. <laughs> Uh, and here is um, some uh, statistics on the parameters. So basically this is signature three exposures. We see that in breast cancer, um, we have quite a high variation, but also uh, on average high exposures. Also uh, in, colo no, oops, in um, colorectal cancer. Uh, and we do have uh, entities where it actually does not happen at all, right? So in hepatobiliary cancer. Um, the same is here for the genomic instability. Uh, so this is uh, very high on average in breast cancer. And I shall say that uh, here inside the breast cancer part or sub-cohort, uh, there's a high enrichment of triple negative cases, right? So uh, that's why they actually enter this uh, molecular tumor board. Um, and uh, yeah, in sarcomas, for example, we do have a high spread actually, but uh, some signal. Um, and uh, this is then the aggregated distributions. In the middle, um, this is a categorical encoding whether the genes in this long list are actually affected, any of these genes is affected or not. And uh, you also can see that this is very uh, skewed from entity, one entity to another. And it's actually debatable whether such a, a tissue agnostic biomarker for Brackenness is justified or not. So recently there was a paper from MSKCC where they claim it's rather not justified to do a tissue agnostic. Um, but in the same paper, they say, so there are four entities which are said to be um, uh, classically uh, Brackenness associated, which is breast, ovary, pancreas, and um, prostate. Uh, but they themselves say that in sarcoma, they see a high prevalence of that. So um, it's the question if it's not allowed to do a tissue agnostic, but what are the entities to consider then? And th this paper has stayed unclear on this aspect actually. So we are more on the side of doing a tissue agnostic, uh, but uh, I cannot actually um, say what comes out of the trial, of course. Yeah? Um, okay. so. Uh, this trial has started. Uh, the case number planning has said it's 102 patients which are requ required. And this trial does not test our biomarker, okay? This trial tests whether in the population enriched by the biomarker, the combination of drugs is uh, efficacious, uh, uh, efficient or not. 
And um, basically, uh, unfortunately, but this is due to a bunch of reasons, um, the trial will not answer whether the biomarker is well chosen or not. We can try to address this in a retrospective analysis, but um, uh, this is not the primary endpoint. And uh, for now, we have recruited 22 patients. There is a futility analysis after 30 patients, so we are almost there. Uh, but futility is rather unlikely because we have the crossover design, right? So crossover always mitigates uh, futility, but dilutes uh, the main signal. Uh, so this is where we are. And um, before actually uh, putting the acknowledgments, I want to advertise uh, a postdoc position. Uh, in the German Cancer Research Center and NCT, which is uh, the National Center for Tumor Diseases. And here, the translational activities of our center are somehow bundled and brought together with the University Hospital, which is uh, next door. And with that, I would say thank you very much for your attention. And I have to acknowledge many, many people who have contributed to this work. Um, yeah, I think it would be too long to read them out all. Yep, thank you very much, and I'm open to questions. I do, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I would say it depends. If you look at absolute exposures, yes, there is a correlation, a rather weak one, but uh, there is a correlation because if you have many mutations in general, your contribution of signature three, if it is there, will be higher than if you have a low mutation count in, uh, in general, right? But if you take the relative contribution, then this correlation vanishes. Yeah? So it's not that the hypermutated ones in general have more uh, brackerness. Mm -hmm. But the score is based on uh, absolute presence. Yes. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. so would you expect a big influence of the mutational uh, burden, even with what you look on the looking at present absence? Mm, no, I, so at least the aim is that it should not interfere too much. Um, and that is part of the game with the argument of the confidence interval, right? Just to give you guys a break. So I thought the big player in the HRD game was Serena Nixainal's HR Detect. Mm -hmm. Have you compared against that? Because yes, so. Show up in your introduction. Um, that's true, and it's on purpose. Uh, ah, so we cannot well, use, <laughs> we cannot use, H it's very similar, yeah, that's for sure. And we cannot use HR detect for several reasons. So the first reason is it only works on whole genome sequencing, and we have a mixture of both technologies with whole exome. And I mean, they are right. It is much better for such a biomarker to have a whole genome sequence sample than to have a whole exome sequence sample. But in our case, we do have to provide something for those patients who uh, just had the other technology. And then there's another point. Uh, they require um, other layers of information. They have a methylation layer, which is very smart to do because a very frequent way of inactivating BRCA1 is hypermethylation on the BRCA1 promoter. But we do not have this layer of information. So again, for reasons of practicability, uh, we had to do something else. And then there's a third reason, which is patent. Uh, so they want to file a patent and um, it was not usable at the time when we started yeah, developing it. Yeah. But you could take their data, uh, yeah. restrict it to exomes, and then it, compute your biomarker and see how, how you compare to their full 
analysis. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what we can do now, since um, the, I don't know if the patient is through or whether they took it back, I'm not into this at all, but um, their software, their pipeline is usable now. And of course, we can run it on our samples. That's what we did, and it correlates very well, actually. Uh, the, what you mentioned uh, is not trivial, actually. So how to downsample from a whole genome to a whole exome? Do you just take out mutations in the intergenic parts? I would say no. Uh, because um, you have two things which may bias then, which is the difference in coverage and via allele frequencies, this actually biases your variant calling. And um, you have off-target reads, uh, which actually um, depends on your variant calling, right? But uh, some variant calling pipelines uh, want to use the descending and the ascending flank next to the target capture region itself to do variant calling in those. So it's not as easy as uh, you would think, at least depending on how confidentially you want to do that. Yeah. Thanks again. I, I, I Maybe a philosophical question, but I feel like the method that you've presented could be used as a classifier for anything, right? So Brachinus is something you've chosen to try to identify, but could you not do a similar method for any outcome or any phenotype? I don't know if any, but uh, a phenotype where maybe something similar could be done is, of course, other DNA repair defects. Yeah, so microsatellite instability, you would focus on other window sizes in both a smoothing and counting for the genomic instability, and there are mutational signatures. So you could try to do something very similar for microsatellite instability. But other phenotypes beyond that, you probably would have to choose other layers of information, I guess. Yeah. And it's very emp empirical, right? Uh, I mean. Thank you.